All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the today's Dreamwakers Daily Conversation. My name is Salit Cato, and today we're speaking with Miss Lena Cortes. Um, Lena is a Colombian writer, artist, and teacher. Uh, she has been creating art and writing ever since she could hold a pencil. <laughs> she is, has been a bilingual teacher for over 20 years and then decided to become a full-time writer and artist about 11 years ago. Um, we're so grateful to have you today. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you, Salit. I'm very happy to be here. So great. So we are broadcasting to a wide audience today. We've got middle schoolers, high schoolers, people looking to go to college, um, all of our educator community. And we would love to just know a little bit more about you, what your life journey has been this far, thus far. Uh, it's been a very long journey, <laughs> very intense. Um, I was born in Colombia. Um, that has a lot to do with who I am. Um, I'm an existential person. I, I follow my heart. Um, I love being able to read the world through two languages. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that I'm bilingual, I think, makes me much more open to uh, other cultures, other people. I, I love being able to tell stories mm -hmm. and uh, I feel blessed. That's amazing. That's beautiful. Um, we actually have an educator who submitted a question. She uh, teaches in Oregon and a wide group. A lot of her students are actually bilingual and come from backgrounds, uh, a variety of backgrounds. And she was just wondering, how do you bring your culture and your language into your work day to day? And what does that mean to you? What does it look like? Um, and do you have any advice for students who are really struggling to accept that part of themselves um, or maybe don't see the benefit of being bilingual or having another cultural background in their day to day life? Wow, that, that's a phenomenal question. And it is so timely mm. because I think life is actually a journey where you are given the chance to find out more and more about who you are. And that's always your biggest strength. Nobody can beat you at being you. And where you come from is essential because that's how you figure out where you're going. Mm -hmm. And today I perceive um, a lot of prejudice and bigotry that I thought we had overcome. And I think it's so important to feed your identity with information about where you come from, where your parents come from, the kind of food that you were brought up with, the cultural uh, distinctions that feed your background. And as, as my children were growing up, I, I loved it when their friends would come and visit mm -hmm. and we would share arepas. Arepas are very important in Colombian culture. And I'm usually playing music, salsa, merengue. I, I break out in song, I start dancing. And when my kids were around elementary school age, they were very embarrassed. But <laughs> as they started growing up and they, they, they started realizing it's actually cool to be from someplace else. And um, it was so neat because their friends would ask me questions and about Colombian food and about phrases that I interject sometimes. I say listo a lot. And many didn't know what listo meant. And that means you're ready for anything. Um, and when I was a teacher, it was crucial. I, I always made arepas with my students. I would take cornmeal into the class and my little toaster oven and we would make arepas because arepas are like our bread. And I think when you actually taste food from another country, your senses are opened into another's reality. And flags, talking about your flag, trying to learn about the cities in your country, um, asking your grandparents before they're gone, what their childhood was like, um, cooking with your parents, and just staying proud mm. of who you are. Absolutely, that's such a beautiful answer. I am very, I want arepas now. <laughs> I need to come and eat some arepas with you. Um, so I would love to little, look, learn a little bit more about um, you now 
own your own publishing company. Um, and I would love to know what that looks like in your day to day. Um, maybe it looks a little bit differently now that a lot of people are working from home and you know, life has a bit of a different rhythm, but I'd love to know your day to day pre all of this work from home um, lifestyle and also now, now that we're working from home more often. It's changed, um, but at the same time, I feel I had a head start mm. because sometimes I'm, I feel I'm a little bit of a nun. <laughs> I, I spend my days writing, painting, reading. Those are my three main activities. Mm -hmm. But because I work at home, I have a very strong routine. Mm -hmm. I also live surrounded by a forest and I take care of a lot of animals. So I, I get up very early and I feed my chickens and the dogs and the deer. Um, I take off running. I always make sure I incorporate exercise into my routine. Otherwise I don't function well. <laughs> and um, so I had a head start. I have a routine and I hold on to it more. But I used to travel a lot. Last year I traveled every month. Um, and so that made me interrupt my projects a lot. But now that I'm stuck at home, I have no excuse. And I find I'm, I'm being much more productive. I organize my files. Um, I contacted you guys again. I am keeping in touch with friends that are important to me and life is just becoming much more meaningful. I am more purposeful in what everything I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people are finding that having a little bit of structure to the days is really helpful, trying to schedule in those opportunities to get out and interact with the world. <laughs> um, Correct. Absolutely. So I'm curious, I know you talked a little bit about um, creating, taking art and what you love and making that into a full-time career. Um, and mm -hmm. you mentioned that sometimes people try to discourage you because art doesn't pay for a living or sort of this idea that art isn't something that can be a career. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your experience with that and how you overcame that and what it's been like for you to really create art and incorporate it into making it a lifelong career for you. You know, it's, it's very interesting because sometimes I feel it wasn't even my conscious decision. Mm -hmm. um, because when I was little, I, I believed I swallowed the pill that I could not make a living with my art. And, uh, I come from a long line of teachers. Uh, it, it's, it was the profession that my grandfather had and my, most of my family. And so I chose teaching because it would be a solid, steady paycheck, but I never stopped creating art or writing. And so when I would have a, an empty slot in my day, I would find myself reading and writing again. <laughs> and so slowly life pivoted me to realize that's what I love to do. And, and in a way it's still teaching. I feel I'm still reaching students, but one day, especially uh, after working in a private school in Dallas, I realized this is not what I want to do anymore. I want to write and I want to create art full time. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was funny because I came full circle. Mm -hmm. I came back to what I love to do. And, and I, I've never created art to sell. That's never been my purpose. I think if you follow your heart and you find a way to serve, mm -hmm. you will take care of paying the bills. Life will figure it, itself out. Mm -hmm. And the more I see the world has changed, the more I understand now there are tools where you can make a living out of your art. And um, I have two grown up children and they're both very creative. And, and I have total faith that they will be able to figure life out with their creative talents. Absolutely. I love that. Um... I'm curious, so we had a, we have asked our community to submit questions to you, and we had a fifth grader from Georgia who wanted to know what is the hardest part of owning your own published company and what's publishing company and what is the most rewarding part of it? So something challenging ah, and something rewarding. That's a beautiful question. Um, it, and it is challenging and rewarding at the same time. It is challenging because the publishing world has changed a lot. I started, 12 years ago and uh, the first time I published a book I published it the traditional way in the US because in Colombia I published with a big publishing company 
I found a publisher in China and we did everything over the internet. I don't speak Chinese. They spoke very crazy English, but we managed to figure it out. And I was stuck with a container full of books. So it was, it was very hard because I had to do the distribution and sell the books. Uh, now there's Amazon. Now there are lots of online platforms. So your book is only printed when somebody buys it. So it's, I think it's more environmentally friendly. You don't have to worry about where you're going to st store those books until you sell them. But it's still up to you. You have to promote the book and hopefully contact people and tell them, I have this book and I hope you read it and you enjoy it. I give a lot of books away. <laughs> <laughs> but I find for every book I give away, I make some sales. So it's, it's all a matter of persisting. I, know, I, I am a very stubborn person. And so <laughs> that helps. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, persistence and resilience, I feel like those are two things you must have cultivated throughout your career, for sure. Um, and knowing that you've you've kind of done a few different things, you know, you were in teaching for so long and you have your publishing company um, and you've really experienced a lot of different career paths. And I know that you mentioned um, there's a lot of research out there that says that the average professional these days will have about five careers in their lifetimes. Um, and so I'm curious, like, what advice would you give or what tips do you have for young people who don't know where to start, who are just kind of considering where do I want to begin? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure where to go next. What advice would you have for them? I think the more you know yourself, the better those choices come naturally to you because there's so much pressure on young people today. Um, when I lived through the college application process with my children, I thought it was pathological completely. I, I didn't grow up in this country, so I didn't understand why you needed to want to go to a specific school. So we took a very laid back approach. Um, they did it, most of it on their own. Um, and I think Life, there is an undercurrent to life. Life is like a river. I lived in the Amazon and I, I, I learned a lot from that majestic river. I think there is a thrust to life that often because we are so technologically driven and so um, structured, we forget life has a course of its own. Look at how we have been humbled by this tiny virus. <laughs> There, there is a thrust to life that you have to let flow. And, and, and you're the, the teachers that are in your life, uh, the role models that are in your life, they are little signposts. Even the books that you're reading, sometimes you find uh, a paragraph in a book that can make you realize, hey, uh, there's space or there are countries in South America that haven't yet been explored. There's so much information that is being given to you by life. And I think those are all signposts that help you nudge, help nudge you towards where you're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all exactly where we're meant to be. And, and we just have to make the best of the situation that life is presenting in front of us. Mm -hmm. And, and, and what a thrill to be alive on this planet, spinning crazily <laughs> in the universe. What are the odds that there would be life in this planet? And, and we have the chance to experience it. And I think we need to be a little simpler. We have made life too complicated. Uh, taste as much as you can, touch as much as you can, explore, meet as many people as you can. It's not really about um, making a living. It's about living mm -hmm. and, and experiencing life fully. Absolutely. I, yeah, such great advice. Um, that's a perfect kind of segue into another question we had from a sixth grader who wants to know what your favorite book is and also of the books that you yourself have written or the art you've created, what's your favorite or most meaningful piece? Wow, that's a beautiful question. Um, my favorite book has always been The Little Prince, uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Um, it's, it's, I think it's, 
it's such an all-encompassing story. It's a fairy tale, um, but it, it speaks to children, it speaks to adults, and there are so many levels to it. It's, it's a beautiful story. It, it never grows old, and I have several copies. So <laughs> when I'm feeling down, uh, the little prince reminds me to go love my rose. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And um, the last book I published, it's called Victoria Amazonica. And it's um, my memories of having lived in the Amazon. And I published it for my mom. I, uh, she died almost two years ago. And I had promised her that I would publish it. And I didn't publish it while she was alive. But within a month of her death, I published it. And I published it in English and in Spanish. And now that the Amazon is burning and uh, that our planet seems to be screaming at us, um, it's much more meaningful. And I, right now I'm, I'm re-editing it. I want to publish it with photos and art because I just published the text to keep my promise but I think I need to share the many pictures that I took of the Amazon and the art that I have been creating for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, so th that, that book is very important to me. And I'm, I'm creating a podcast um, based on the Amazon stories because the overall message is that we never achieve any of our victories alone. They're mm -hmm. always achieved because of community. And I think it's such a timely message. We we need others. That's why we're reaching out. Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's so um, that, that's that's a beautiful question. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to seeing that. I'm sure you have such a unique perspective having lived there and now watching how it's evolved over just your lifetime. Um, that's that's super important to capture those stories and share them. True. Yeah. So a little bit more about your publishing house. I know that it's called Lunia, which translates to little moon, correct? Right? Did I get that Lunita. right? Lunita. Lunita. Uh -huh. Lunita. Um, can you tell us why you chose that name and what it means to you? Yes. Uh, my name is Lina, which means daughter of the moon. Mm -hmm. I was born right two months after men landed on the moon. And my mom dreamed that I was either Lina or Alina. And the moon has always been uh, a huge motif in my life. Mm -hmm. And I want to be like the moon. I, I, I think I was born to bring some light into the world. And that's why I chose Lunita because she, she is a powerful, humbling force. And um, I think we all came to walk each other home. Mm -hmm. and, and Lunita has been my vehicle to share my stories. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, I, I dearly love Lunita. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so we're running a little low on time, so we just have one more sort of wrap-up question. Um, you have shared so much of your story with us. I really appreciate that and hearing about your Colombian heritage and how important that is to you and to your art. Um, and I guess I'm just curious, what are a couple of pieces of advice, um, things you would like to impart to people who are watching this conversation? What are a couple of things you want them to take out of uh, what we've talked about today? Wow. Um, I want them to remember that books are the best of friends. They're unconditional. Um, they open a portal into another world. Mm -hmm. Every book uh, can transport you to a different place or to another human being's experience. So books are such powerful weapons and they make us smarter. They gave, they teach us, they give us humility and now we have time. So go to the library or check out your own bookcase and revisit some of your favorite books or dive into new ones. And the second one, um, which is I think very, very timely is that Living is a daily choice and um, falling in love with life is a daily challenge. Life is asking us every day, who are you? And you answer with every decision you make. Mm -hmm. So make that breakfast substantial. Um, decide you're going to do something for that beautiful body that you have been given. Um, reach out to someone you haven't talked to in a while make every day count because every day counts. 
Absolutely. You've inspired me to reread The Little Prince. It's been so many years and I, I remember loving it. So that is a great book. Um, it's beautiful. I have a little free library. I don't know if you're, you've heard of those. Yeah. And um, I love my little free library. And last week, somebody brought me a luxury edition. Oh, and so <laughs> that's so sweet. I, I felt like life was giving me a present. And so I just finished rereading it and, and man I I just love it more <laughs> oh that's amazing and now I definitely have to get my hands on a copy immediately <laughs> absolutely uh, so thank you for joining us today and thank you to all of our viewers who are tuning in to watch um, we really appreciate it and we hope you enjoyed today's dream wakers daily um, all of our conversations are going to be posted on our Facebook page after they air and we will be doing one of these every single day at 1 p.m. so feel free to tune in tomorrow if you want to speak with another, if you want to see a conversation with another uh, career professional.